welcome to another episode of the Sport of Bowling Show. On this week's show, we feature USBC Executive Director Chad Murphy, PWBA and USBC Hall of Famer and 20-time PWBA champion Wendy McPherson, Bowlers Journal International Editor John Mark Manzio, InsideBowling.com founder Mike Flanagan, USBC Senior Director of Digital Media Jason Thomas. And now, it's time for the Sport of Bowling Show. Hey there. Good uh, morning, afternoon from the International Bowling Campus. Happy to have everybody today. Welcome back to the Sport of Bowling Show. We've got, a, I think, an incredible guest today on the show. Can't wait. Uh, I'm actually a little nervous. Wendy McPherson is going to be joining us here in a little while, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, got a got a good show. Lots of uh, interesting topics, some business, obviously some um, you know lighter conversation, and then um, um, some very specific things that we're going to talk about. But I hope everybody will uh, tune in. Maybe ask a few questions from the chat, and we'll see where that goes. I'm going to bring in first uh, John Mark from Bowler's Journal. Uh, John Mark, I. You know, welcome to the show again. Thanks for being a part of it. Happy to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, just what's going on with uh, Bullish Journal? I know we got a new mag dropping this week. What what uh, what's going on with you this week? And and you know, please include your your home family, everything that's going on with you. Uh, the we we still have two small children crawling all over us every waking minute of our lives, and uh, trying to continue with our lives uh, uh, in spite of that. So. Yes, somehow I, I did manage to get uh, another issue of Bowler's Journal out. Um, and I want to make one point for people who don't know it. Uh, let's see. There it is. So that's Kim Adler, USBC Hall of Famer Kim Adler, 16-time PWBA Tour champion Kim Adler, incredible bowler who now works as a nurse practitioner uh, in, in uh, Florida. This photo, which made the cover of this issue of Bowler's Journal, was taken by her 8-year-old daughter, Emma. So pretty impressive that she's getting uh, she's getting things started in her own uh, life uh, with a photo credit on the cover of of a magazine. So just really cool thing, and we ran a photo credit for her on the inside uh, a cover. Very cool. uh, yeah, Emma Adler. So just just really really neat uh, that she that we were able to get that on the cover. Um, and that cover story promotes a um, piece on what it's been like for Kim Adler, for Aaron McCarthy, PWBA champion in the president incarnation of the tour, who also works as a nurse, a registered nurse in Omaha. Um, and also Brenda Mack, a PWBA champion, a former collegiate star uh, who's working as a registered nurse in the Indianapolis area. Of course, the wife of Storm Ball Rep, Tim Mack, USBC Hall of Famer. Uh, what has it been like for them to be on the front lines of this pandemic? Um, and some of the some of the realities that they're facing are pretty stark, uh, and I think our readers will will take uh, a lot from from the things that they have to say about their experience uh, battling this pandemic. A lot more in this in this issue uh, from that angle. For example, um, you know, people say that that bowling has been through a lot, and we look specifically at what bowling has been through and come back from in this issue. Uh, the 1918 Spanish flu which killed 675,000 people in the United States alone, 50 million people worldwide. Uh, and bowling found a way back from that. And certainly it, it, uh, the, the, that pandemic had uh, an impact on, on the bowling industry. Um, in 1966, <clears throat> I learned thanks to Lyle Zykes, who's a genius uh, bowling historian and researcher when it comes in particular to the PBA tour, uh, there was the 1966 St. Paul Open in which 22 of the bowlers who started that event were sidelined by the flu in just that one event. Wow. Um, so pretty amazing recollection uh, that Lyle brings up. Um, we also talked with uh, someone perhaps you've heard uh, of, about, uh, Chad, a guy named Chad Murphy, who was quoted in a story in the issue, um, along with uh, very experienced proprietor Kevin Krause. Um, and, and Chad, you, along with Kevin, give what I found to be a pretty helpful and, and um, illuminating perspective on uh, not just saying, well, bowling's going to come back from this, but really how. Um, what, in fact, 
Um, yes, is there a lot of chaos that's been created by this pandemic? Of course. Um, but what are the opportunities perhaps that that chaos might present? And both Chad, you and, and Kevin make the point that uh, people, when they're able to, when, when it is indicated to folks that they can safely leave their homes and enjoy their lives out in public again, um, they're going to be itching to enjoy uh, what Kevin Krauss called repeatedly in my uh, interview with him, uh, bowling's status as the, the original social network. Uh, this is a this is the, the original social network where people have been gathering for a long time, a community gathering place. And, and if ever there were a time when people desperately needed that kind of camaraderie, that kind of experience of just being together with folks, uh, it, it's now. And bowling centers, as Kevin makes uh, makes th this point in the story, as you make the point as well, Chad, in the story, um, are going to be able to, to appeal to that craving that people are going to have on the other side of this. Um, in addition to the magazine, Chad, I just want to mention also that we have a brand new podcast that went up yesterday featuring Jason Del Monte. Uh, people can find that by going to SoundCloud, look up the Bowler's Journal podcast, and Jason talks at length about uh, COVID-19's impact on his career, his family, and on the bowling industry at large. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I can't wait to read it, uh, John Mark. And, you know, those three ladies that you talked about, all, you know, good friends of mine, and, and we're thinking about them and all the Absolutely. work that they're doing. And, um, you know, I, I just, I think it's great that you covered them and even the podcast you had. So so just really appreciate you going through all that. So everybody check out the latest issue of uh a bowler's journal that, that John Mark just laid out. I want to bring in Mike Flanagan from Inside Bowling. Mike, how are you? Hey, top of the day to you guys. How are we doing? Everybody doing good? Doing good, man. Great. Uh, tell us what you've been up to this week. Uh, you and, you know, Mr. Farber and, and everything that's going on. Yeah, well, we completed episodes 11 through 15 of our new Inside Bowling show that's broadcast on Facebook Live and uh, YouTube as well. We had TJ and DJ, Tommy Jones and DJ Archer on the program on Monday. We had Adam Barta on Tuesday, Jim Callahan on Wednesday, EJ Tackett yesterday. And we just finished up a show uh, with Shannon and Brian O'Keefe. Uh, pretty entertaining shows over there. So we've been enjoying doing that. I've enjoyed seeing Matt as this is his first time ever being on the airwaves or doing a show, watching him mature throughout the episodes. And, and that's been a cool process for me to go through. We also work with a bunch of other clients as well. One of them being the United States Bowling Congress, and I can't talk about it, but it's been a very, very good week working with your team over there, Chad, on some cool stuff that's going to be coming in the future that I think is going to provide some great value for the members and for people that are that are just uh, involved and fans of the United States Bowling Congress. So that'll be cool to see come out in the future. We've also been working with our other clients like BowlerX.com. We've been doing this match game thing over there uh, where we're doing this game show with pro bowlers and stuff like that. So, so we're putting those out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're working with a couple of bowling center clients that we've worked with on working on a, on a strategy on once they do open back up, how we can digitally go out and, and attract people to feel okay to come into the bowling centers, get back to bowling, do it in a safe way, and still generate some revenue for those proprietors that need it so desperately. So uh, we've got a lot going on over here with who we work with, and uh, we're just trying to mow through it and, and adjust to the waters that were, that were held as we steer the ship down the water. So that's what's going on yeah. over here. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, all of it's so, you know, important when we when we talk about, you know, communicating informationally, all the things that go with that. New to the show uh, this week is a, a, a bowling icon. Uh, he has a nickname that I like to, um, to use that he sometimes laughs at, but the hardest working man in bowling is joining this week. And so I'm really excited about that. Jason Thomas, uh, Jason, when I, you know, really went to kind of introducing you into this, I, I, I felt like giving your whole resume, uh, but I knew you wouldn't like it. So just, a very I'm going to give a, short I'm going to give you, I'm just going to give a little light, but I, I met Jason when he was working with PBA a long time ago. And, uh, you know, some people would say, you know, decades ago, if you will, but Jason's been in bowling his entire life. He's he's worked for you know the PBA here at USBC. He's done some really cool things on his own, uh, kind of in between those two things or coming in and out of it. He's got perspective, you know, that come from you know icons of sport, you know, like Steve Miller and and some of those folks. But now he makes his home here at USBC as our 
uh, senior director of the hardest working man in bowling, which uh, I think is a pretty cool title. I don't know how you got that, but uh, you I, I prefer share? that to icon. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But tell us what's going on with uh, with you, what you've been working on, of course, you know, the family uh, with everybody working at, at home and, and just welcome to the show, man. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I've been behind the scenes on the show. Uh, that's one of the things I've been working on uh, in my garage. Uh, so, yeah, it's been uh, that's really what I've been working on is getting all this new content up and running, um, you know, as well as trying to plan for when we can go back to having events. You know, events are obviously the thing that we love doing. Um, you know, I, I had a phone call with with Greg Moore at 10 o'clock the other night. Man, he just he is itching to go back and, and run some tournaments and, and put on some TV shows. And and uh, I am as well. So we're trying to I feel like a backup quarterback. You know, you're trying to. You're waiting for your chance to go back in and play, uh, but you don't know when that's going to come. So we're trying to just be ready for when uh, the opportunity to come back and do some events happens. But in the meantime, we want to try to create a lot of new great content. And so this show is one of the things we're doing, which uh, I think has been really great and transitioning kind of into a, a, a more of a guest uh, format this week, which should be pretty cool. Um We've got the PWBA show that's been going for 10 episodes. We've got uh, Sydney Brummett coming up on that show later this afternoon. And we had Julia Bond on earlier this week. Uh, John Gaines was on the uh, Open Championships podcast earlier this week. And he was one of the one of the people that uh, put me into retirement. I once pulled a, a high roller <laughs> sweeper squad with him. And he was playing sixth era with the Purple Maxim uh, throwing <laughs> messengers. And I was trying to shoot 400 from a uh, two board with uh, with a blue U2. So I figured I, I was better on the sidelines <laughs> than out on the lanes after that one. Uh, and then AJ Chapman was on uh, uh, just uh, yesterday on the Open Championships uh, podcast. So a lot of great new content. We've got even more planned. Uh, we've got the Queen's Ultimate Bracket Challenge, which has been going on. So if you, you've been following that and seeing the cool blogs, uh, uh, Daniel Ferris did a great blog the other day, just kind of envisioning what, what he was seeing, uh, imagining what those matches would be like. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out over on pwba.com and on the, uh, the social pages, do that. It's, it's pretty fun. Uh, but yeah, just, just trying to stay busy. And uh, at home, uh, I was in quarantine for 14 days. Uh, I was out traveling when this whole thing happened. So I didn't want to get anyone sick. And so I got a real taste of what real quarantine is like, which wasn't very fun. Uh, but ever since then, I've just been trying to enjoy the time home. Um, normally at this point in the year, I'd be, I'd be on the road quite a bit. So I'm trying to enjoy being home with the kids and spending time with them in addition to, you know, all the work that we're doing. Very cool. Thanks. Uh, well, there's a lot of content out in the bowling world. So, uh, thanks everybody. There's, there's obviously content that, that, you know, uh, way that we didn't mention there. I, I listened to, uh, Coley Edison, CEO of the PBA on, uh, the, the beef and Barnsey show, which I thought was really you know, interesting. I, I know that their their challenges are, are similar to ours and in, in Major League Baseball and uh, the National Hockey League and the NBA. Everybody's, you know, trying to to, you know, make it go. So I, I thought that was really interesting. Sean Ryan uh, was on the uh, Sweep the Rack podcast, which, you know, was another kind of interesting piece. But there's just so much good content. I hope everybody's enjoying it. And I hope it will continue, you know, as we move forward. A few USBC updates, Junior Gold uh, 2021, uh, just went live a few minutes ago. We'll certainly get some, you know, questions and comments about that, but, but we promised a, a year ago, some additional information about junior gold would be, uh, launched May 1. That's out. Uh, Gary Brown and IBC youth are prepared for all the questions, uh, that might come in and, and we'll kind of scoop some of those up and, and talk about them a little, uh, next week. The open and champ open and women's championships, you know, opening for the fall has been, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It has been so uh, interesting while, um, you know, polarizing in some ways, the conversation, some folks, you know, think we got to cancel. There's some other folks that, you know, really want us to have the event. Uh, you know, just talking about Greg there a few minutes ago, you know, obviously our folks are working hard to, to possibly offer it if the, the health and safety can be secured by then. The event's four and a half months out, and I think that's kind of the, the sauce that maybe may allow us to do it. When I read about some of the other major sports, NASCAR's coming back in a couple weeks with no fans. Uh, golf a couple weeks after that with no fans. I don't know how much you guys are paying attention to the scenarios and some of the other 
the sports. Uh, New York Magazine had an interesting article I read this week. Uh, but it's just really been amazing. But, um, you know, we had 3,200 plus teams uh, enter already for the Open uh, and uh, almost 1,900 for the women's just with a, you know, kind of a soft opening, knowing that it's it's four and a half months away. And so we already had to expand the capacities. Uh, some folks get really excited about expanding capacity, and it sounds like a great message. Uh, sometimes it looks like a lack of planning. Uh, I would tell you in this world that is COVID-19, there, there is no, you know, accurate planning. We, we did our best to kind of build the events around 4,000 and maybe 2,000 teams. And, and it looks like, you know, there's, there's pent up demand that, that's going to push that up. So really proud of our team in, uh, you know, pushing that and getting it out quickly. We're, we're not even a week into registration and we already opened the capacity. I had a, an interesting text from a proprietor this week that asked, you know, how I would uh, describe that uh, in thinking about folks wanting to, to come back and bowl league and, and would one equate to the other in terms of, you know, excitement. And um, we're hearing from, from all over the country different things and different stories. But my answer was that I think it is. I think people, you know, want to get back out if it's safe, uh, want to venture back out in the world. But, but obviously thinking about um, you know, it being safe and, and some of the things that the proprietors are going to do, uh, to make it, uh, safe, uh, has been fun to watch. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tease it. Uh, Frank, the social will be joining this show next week. Uh, and we're going to spend a little time talking about all the efforts that BPA is making. John Mark, I know you'll be here and, and Mike Flanagan, Tony, uh, Franklin's going to join us next week with Frank. We're going to spend an entire hour, uh, just talking about, uh, bowling centers and, and what it's going to look like in this new world and what BPA is doing to help. In addition to some, uh, I hope, uh, advanced storing telling about uh, Frank and, and allowing uh, folks to, to get to know him a little bit better. Uh, maybe the, the second uh, hardest work of man in bowling right, right <laughs> after uh, Jason Thomas. So uh, again, I appreciate you guys being here this week. Lots going on, uh, but some positive in there too, right? We're looking for better days ahead. And, um, and and hoping that uh, everybody in the marketplace is, is taking care of themselves so that when those better days arrive, we're, we're ready to get back after it. I know we got a uh, you know pretty a, a cool guest uh, coming on here in a few minutes, but does anybody have anything they want to talk about before we bring her in? I'm just curious, Chad, you know, to what extent can the demand for this year's uh, postponed, delayed uh, start date, open and women's championships um, give you like a frame of reference within which to to get a gauge on, you know, bowling's future in a post pandemic world, how bowling can come back from this? Is there a correlation there that you'd like to talk about? Well, I think, again, it's always going to be a good question and there's so many unknowns, but I, I think all the great things about bowling that were there before will be hereafter. And I think that's why it will be so resilient. I think that's why we're seeing so much demand for the championships. The other thing that's kind of unique about my job is I hear from a lot of association leaders. I hear uh, from a lot of consumers, you know, when people say, well, you know, how many, you know, are you really answering the membership? And the answer is yes. I mean, we answer membership calls and emails every day uh, from rules to customer service to, to my inbox and, and my phone. I talked to a, a 70 year old man this week that, that bowls four leagues. Wow. Uh, and he's ready to get back, but, but obviously he's in that high risk group and communicated that he was mm. in the high risk group. And, you know, he's asking USBC to take, uh, it, it was interesting. He, his perspective was that, you know, why wouldn't USBC and the way we're operating our tournaments and apply that to a league setting and, and get it down to one team per pair. And, and I essentially explained that, you know, proprietors are thinking and working about on those things, too. And depending on their local guidelines, it's just going to be really important, which is at the heart of your question is how does bowling return in this post yeah. pandemic? Well, this new normal is going to be different everywhere. And so, you know, we had a great conversation. I really enjoyed uh, talking to him because his perspective though was that a lot of the younger folks, uh, aren't that concerned and want to get back in and bowl, you know, five man or four man teams on, on, you know, two lanes, just like we always have, where some of these other folks that are more high risk that are mixed in our leagues, that there's going to have to be a balance between the two. And so when you think about that and, and, you know, I think it's all going to return. It's just time, right? Yeah. It's just understanding. And it's going to be very different in Michigan and New York and, and yeah. New Jersey 
uh, than maybe some of the other states. Opening day, you know, May 1 in Texas today. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, working out of the office again, even though our staff is still working from home. Why is that? Well, you know, I, I'm interested to drive around and see whether some restaurants open up. 25% capacity is a rough way to open up. Yeah. Uh, if you're a business owner, will it cost you more money than it would, you know? And so there's that kind of argument between opening up fully and our proprietors are in the, the same boat. Yep. I read uh, Bob Johnson's a cyber report yesterday and there were some really good good things in that. I don't know if you guys spent any time in there, but I got two quotes I want to mix in here at some point in time today. But uh, the guy from from Bar Rescue, you know, offered, hey, rather than freaking out about the pandemic, I've just been focused on what do our business look like when we're open? Things are going to be different. And I think that's what bowling proprietors and working with BPA are doing too. And honestly, I think it's what our members and our league officers are thinking about too. And so if there are association leaders that need help, you know, feel free to give us a call. But it's been interesting to talk to all these folks uh, about some of those things and, and really see it progress. I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Anybody uh, else have anything? I know we're itching to get to Wendy. Yeah, I think I think for me, you know, as I process May 1st here in Utah, as I'm in Ogden, Utah, uh, I can go get a haircut today if I choose to. Now, I don't know how 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 long it's going to take to get a haircut. I know that great clips down the hill for me. I can I can go online and I can get in the queue and then go in whenever I want. But do I really want to get a haircut today? I don't know if that's something I want to do or not. So I can just imagine the people that are thinking about going bowling, what it's like to, to go bowling. I mean, a haircut is a necessity, uh, especially at this point in time. But but from a from a bowling standpoint, you know, it's a recreational activity. It's something that that you don't have to do. You know, you have to eventually get a haircut. So I'm just I mean, I'm anxious to see how how things start to evolve because I'm wondering about getting a haircut today. And I'm sure there's yeah. some opinions out there that people that are watching the show, whether a bowling center should open up. I thought when you came out with the open championships starting as late as it was, I thought, man, these guys, they're going to be really late to the party. I, I think that it should start sooner personally. But now that now that it's all played out and I've seen a couple of weeks go by since you made the announcement, I think you were spot on with the announcement. What the heck was I thinking? So it's it's interesting to see all the social media behavior and opinions, which we're going to get and we want to get because we want to talk about bowling. But I'm just not sure how to process the world right now. So that's kind of where my head's at right now in regards to all of this. Yeah, I'm sure you're no different when you think about processing the world. Right. There's, you know. 350 million people that are, are thinking about do I do I is it safe to get back in the water right and so when you think about bowling centers and going bowling it, it's no different but consumer demand is something that we're going to have to to watch and, and manage um JT you headed out to eat today uh no no Taking the, family you know, out the, to the problem is if if anybody gets it in my house I'm the one that's going to die so I, I'm 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 trying to just be as safe as I can Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, my kids are all healthy and young and, and my wife, you know, she's never had a, a drink or a cigarette in her life. And, and if she gets it, she'll be just fine. But, you know, the but old, Jason uh, living that rock and roll life you've been living, you're at risk, aren't you? That's right. That's right. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the side of let's just, uh, let's be safe and let's, let's, <laughs> let's let some other people, uh, be the guinea pigs. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thanks guys. We'll, you know, this next guest that we're going to bring in, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I appreciate you guys uh, sending me a couple of texts and and thinking about, you know, having her on. Uh, wonderful lady. I, I got a couple bios here and, and we're certainly going to talk about bowling. But uh, this lady is much more than a than a Hall of Fame bowler. Uh, she's a wonderful human being, uh, great family, lots of friends all over the world. And so I'd like to welcome in uh, Winnie McPherson uh, to the show. Uh, hi, Gwen. How are you? Chadwick, I'm good. How are you guys? How are you? Great. You mind if I read some of your bio or you want me to, to wait a little while, wait till later? Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, w w what's the difference between now and later? Uh, it's just going to be how I, you know, maybe get a little less nervous to talk about all your accomplishments and how cool they are versus asking you. Uh, just starting out, how's your family? How's Nick? How's Blair? How's, you know, all your friends? How's Brad at, yeah. at High Roller? Uh, everybody doing all right out there? We are great. Thank you. Um, as, as, you know, I've, I'm living with a couple wild cards. Um, my husband is an, an essential worker at Costco, um, and that's a wild card. Um, my sister 
actually lives in a, uh, we have like two homes in one. So my sister lives in another home um, uh, with us and she's a nurse. So I think she's a little wild card too. Although, um, you know, she's been, it's been slow at the, at the hospital, you know, as they say, a lot of hospitals have been underwhelmed um, as opposed to overwhelmed. And um, she's in one of the departments that I believe is a little underwhelmed with, uh, she's in with uh, new moms, labor and delivery, even though babies are being born, they're not staying so long, you know, they're in and out really quick. So she's, her shifts have been reduced significantly. So in that aspect, she's been home more, so that's good. It's been a, a wild card. Nick has been a lot safer. Nick, on the other hand, we're doing great. No, no issues whatsoever. But Costco is a wild card. It's a busy place, um, busier than we all really know. Yeah, and tell them both that we love them and we're thinking about them. And thanks for doing what they do. I, I you know, when I was thinking about having you on, that you know, I obviously knew those things, and and, and I'm glad you went there first because, you know when you think about nurses and, and people on the front lines and delivering, you know, even, even groceries is a, is a new normal for everybody. So uh, let them know. Uh, thanks. Uh, I will get to a lot of this, but my kind of next piece for this was, you know, I know you also have a lot of friends around the world, you know, Carol Ann being one of them, I'm sure you're in, you're in contact, uh, you know, even, you know, Australia being a, a little different. I, I read an article yesterday on what's going on there, but uh we're looking forward to Carol's speech, just like we enjoyed yours at the PWVA Hall of Fame uh, banquet uh, later this year. I know you're you're probably looking for it too, but uh, but you know, have you have you talked to any of those folks? How's everybody doing? Often, I speak with Carol Ann often. You know, I was surprised Australia was a good two three weeks um, uh, doing their lockdowns after us. Um, Carol was still working. Rick, her fiance, I believe, was in Bali. Um, you know, during the the latter part of March, and um, finally, uh, she had told me that she's a manager of one of the AMS centers there, and um, she had finally told me that they had closed down her enter it's an entertainment center. They had closed it down, um, and she was going to be home indefinitely not knowing what was going on so i think they are a little bit behind us but they're doing really good she does video chat her mom and dad are both in their 70s she has not seen or hugged them either and they're right around the corner um but their whole family knock on wood as carol always says knock on wood um everybody is doing great that's good to hear uh it's great to hear uh really uh, one more question before we get into the the Wendy the Bowler and then to some of the other topics. I know a lot of the folks that would watch this show, Bowler Open Championships and Women's Championships in Vegas, and you know from some of the pictures. And I know you know where you live is a little bit outside the the city, but I know you're you're probably you know moving around grocery store and that type of stuff. Well, what's it like there? Uh, obviously, I'm I'm sure a very different uh, city than what you're used to, but um, what what's it like? You know in the car, you know, driving through Las Vegas right now? You know, it only has been the last few weeks um, that I have noticed a, a, pick, a significant pickup in cars. It was very quiet the first month. Um, and with the, the, the shutdown happened, I believe it was Tuesday, uh, March the, I think it was St. Patty's Day. We had, the governor gave orders that Everything must be closed at midnight. We went down at, at 11.55 to the strip. We drove the strip um, at 12, 12.30 a.m. Wanted to, I'd never seen anything like it, nor had anybody, um, you know, in their own, right, their own city had never seen anything like it. And very intimidating to see chains on doors, so on and so forth. Um, you know, um, about a week later, we did another trip down on the strip, night and day. And again, there were only a few, um, unfortunately, still the homeless around, but um, there were no cars anywhere. And my husband, being a photographer, loved it. You know, as a, he hates people, doesn't do any people shots. So it was his opportunity to get structures with no people in it. And... Um, 
you know, it, it's been um, where we're, we're, I'm very fortunate in my life in that my home is up a little bit on a hill and um, we have a, a few few views of the city and there's, I, I'm guessing 50% of, of lights on, you know, 50% of the strip is darker um, and it's, it's, it's quite sad. We will investigate areas and determine whether they're darker as weeks went by and um, such a beautiful city and it's quite dark and quiet. Yeah, I appreciate the perspective. I want to make sure I gave you a chance there to, because I think that's what, you know, maybe some folks, you know, don't quite understand. We see Vegas as this entertainment capital when we go there where you you live there. And I know when we've, you know, had meals over, I always ask you, you know, you know, how much different is it living in Vegas? But, and I always am fascinated because it really isn't any different than, you know, living in, in Dallas, except there's these, you know, the skyline and, and this, you know, casinos, and we'll get into some of some of that. But uh, in full disclo disclosure, I want to make sure everybody, you know, kind of understands uh, my relationship with Wendy. It goes back a lot of years. Um, I, I spent some time as Wendy's tour rep, uh, you know, carrying her her bowling balls at different times. Uh, and she oh, asked her if you ever get a chance to sit with her. But but truthfully, uh, it was uh, the high rollers where I really met Wendy. Uh, and she's very involved now. So I'm going to bring in some other folks, but, but while I do, I, I just want to, you know, 20 PWBA titles, U S open as an 18 year old high school senior, uh, PWBA rookie of the years, five more majors, uh, later on in, in her career. Um, only two players that have won the Queens three times, which was really fun to watch. Uh, it happened, uh, there, um, Youngest to win the Triple Crown at 22. Um, and, and I parallel a little bit of what's going on with Anthony Simonson's career uh, with Wendy back in the day as kind of an interesting uh, piece of that. PWBA Player of the Year four times over a five-year period. Uh, so dominant is, is a word that could be used to describe uh, Wendy. Um, All-time leader. Uh, PWBA career earners, high, record for highest earnings in a CW, single PWBA. And Winnie, I just want you to know that I pulled some of that from the PWBA website, but I also think it's pretty cool that I could pull it from Wikipedia, which makes you a, a superstar uh, with, with superpowers that go beyond uh, just bowling. So I'm going to open up to the group to, to, to let them, you know, pepper you a little bit uh, about, you know, some of your bowling. I always describe Wendy when I tell uh, folks about tour up and for Wendy, uh, it was just incredibly fun, somewhat, sometimes very, very easy, uh, uh, but sometimes very, very difficult in only that one way, which is if we could get her set up, you didn't have to come back for three, three and a half hours uh, because she just, you know, knew her stuff or, was able to repeat and was just just lights out, which you know was was part of her greatness. So, guys, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the uh, Wendy the Bowler, and then we'll we'll get to a few other topics down the road. I'll kick it off. How you doing, Wendy? Michael, I'm well. How are you, sir? Good. I miss uh, working some of the events with you. I, we've had we've had some fun and some great conversations. I think the thing that, that I'd like for you to share with us today for all the folks that maybe uh, have either forgotten about you or or maybe just don't remember all your success that you had. But you had a lot of success here. But when the PWBA tour ended, you know, what were you going to do with with your career or what were you going to do next? And I remember a specific decision that you made when you went over to Japan and you bowled over in Japan. Could you share with us a, a couple of uh, stories from what you did once the once the tour folded and you went over to Japan to compete? Absolutely. You know, Mike, um, it wasn't a plan. Um, you know, when our tour folded in 2003, did I think it was going to come back in 2004? I did. I thought it was just months away from reorganizing getting some funding under us and going when it didn't happen right away i i was questioning it but i didn't have a plan um you know i i graduated from high school i was going to be a bowler i didn't have a plan and at that time uh, college was um pushed aside simply because it wasn't stressed and it wasn't available like it is now with um 
you know, scholarships and as many schools that have collegiate bowling. So it wasn't a plan. And when it, and then when it ended, I thought I really honestly was under the assumption it was going to read, it was going to start up again. But it didn't. And I received that, you know, you, you, you never forget where you're from and you never forget your great friends in life. And one of my great friends, and I, I was a junior bowler at my, um, the Hillman's Cloverleaf Family Bowl in, in Fremont. And I had bowled juniors with Leanne Barrett Holstenberg. I had bowled juniors with Kim Terrell Kearney. Um, and there was some talk and discussion in Japan. They wanted to see the PWBA ladies. And years ago, um, Mr. Masataka Gucci had arranged and gotten together with the JPBA, and they did a collegiate event years ago. Um, in the late 90s, um, they did a collegiate event. So they still had their connections in the bowling industry, and Mas Masataka was given the task of finding um, PWBA ladies to come over to Japan. Now, amongst the collegiate part, um, Mr. Don Hillman ha was very active in that collegiate, I believe it was 10 collegiate bowlers, five ladies, five men from California that went to Japan in the 90s. So, and that was arranged through Don Hillman. Okay. So Don Hillman, um, by the way, passed a BCAA president also. Um, but Don Hillman had um, um, become great friends with Masataka Gishi. So now Masataka expresses his desire for PWBA going to Don Hillman. Don Hillman was where Leanne Barrett Holstenberg grew up in his bowling center. I bowled league there. So it, again, it went back to when I was seven, eight, nine years old. Through that connection, I was asked to come over in 2004 to bowl the Prince Cup. And, it, and, and that was in December of 2004. Next thing I know, I won that as an invite. I won it. Okay. Um, I believe Leanne was third and I believe Kim was fourth. Um, and it was Leanne. Leanne went. Kim um, Kearney went. Carol Giannotti went, and I went. The four of us went. Time of our life. Well, two weeks, you know, we did challenges every day, and we bowled this tournament, and I won. So Masataka, hmm, Wendy, you get membership. Masataka, no. So, you know, I appreciate coming over here for the tournament. I had a great time. No. Wendy, you get, you get membership. All right, I'll get membership. What do I need to do? So now there's no, there's no Americans having membership. So in order for me to get membership, I had to be uh, referred to, um, voted on, allowed in, and then I had to be ranked. It was about a two, uh, year and a half process. Because I was PW, because I was PWBA member and PBA member, I did not have to, uh, uh do the test, the test. The test is two week um, uh, trial. You must bowl for two weeks straight, many different cities, and you must pass a written test over a week. A week's time, a written test, all kanji, when you can't do it. But I was exempt because I was a PBA member. They automatically gave me membership. So I got membership. I went to a ranking tournament in June. I, because you can't bowl a tournament unless you are ranked. So the higher rank you get, you can bowl. When you're out of ranking, a higher rank seed must drop out before you get in. Anyways, make a long story short, I, I got membership. I got ranking. I picked, picked and choose. Um, I, I selected my own tournaments that I wanted to go to. And it was about five or six. Remember, JCBA at that time had 25 tournaments, women. The men had about nine or eight. The women had tons of tournaments. I picked about five or six. Again, I had to, a mandatory to have an interpreter, mandatory to do this, 
take a long story short, I was embraced by Masataka Gucci and the Gucci family out of Mishima, Shizuoka. Um, I lived with them. I was embraced by um, Kimiko Zaitsu, the Zaitsu family with Sazuka Bowl in, um, in Sazuka, uh, downtown Tokyo. And I was embraced by two interpreters, um, Alice Napolis, Alice Margaret Fuchi Napolis, and Ishikawa Pro, Sachiko Ishikawa Pro. They were my two interpreters, and I was embraced by them. I was driven to, taken care of, and make a long story short, they are the only reason that I had the career I had over in Japan. Yeah, and, and when just, just stepping in there for a second, how many times did you end up winning and how many tournaments did you bowl? I won 10 titles. Um, <laughs> and I bowled maybe about 40, 30. <laughs> yeah, I think the, one of the cool things for me about the, you know, Wendy in Japan is that, you know, you had such an impact on, on so many young girls in the States when you were bowling PWBA and they were watching you know, you bowl on TV and then you got to do it on another continent. And I, I think it's just amazing. And, and I just want to share with you real quick, cause you're probably not watching, but I, I, I got the chat pulled up uh, and, you know, Stacy Ryder and Marlis Tapp have joined us uh, today Two two longtime friends for you. I, I know. And so I, I haven't, uh, <laughs> you know, touched base with them in a long time. So I wanted to say hi to, to Marlis and Stacy and, and thanks for being here. Uh, John Mark, you have anything for Wendy? Wendy, what's one thing you learned from your experience bowling uh, on tour that you would like to impress upon today's generation of PWBA tour competitors? Respect, there is. Um, you know, I, 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 I arrived, everybody was Miss, Miss Betty, Miss Judy. Um, you never left the bowling center without congratulating those bowlers that did well. Nice bowling, nice block, nice bowling. Um, uh, I think sometimes lack of respect um, is, is sometimes boggled and is, uh, confused with a little bit of jealousy. Um, I don't know if, if they're jealous that somebody did better than them. Just make sure you, you always, always, um, uh, you know, congratulate your superiors respect your elders and, and that you always say thank you because um, it, it's not a privilege it's an honor and um, you know I, I was just more than blessed with, with my life and my career JT you got one you want to hop in there yeah I, I think I have one that's kind of along the same lines you know one, one of my favorite moments of that Hall of Fame ceremony was uh, when Jason Overstreet introduced you he, he ticked off a few of your maybe lesser known statistics about your career. And one of them was that you once made 15 consecutive TV finals. And I remember looking around the room at the younger players who weren't aware of that. And they were doing the math in their head. They're like, she made every show for a whole season. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would just, I would be interested to hear what, what that experience that night was for you and, and being able to make the connection to those younger players about how great you were and how great you are. You know, Jason, um, uh, that whole, that whole announcement. And I believe if my memory serves me correctly, I, I believe I received a phone call from Chad and like, February 2nd or 3rd, congratulating me. Um, you know, and at that point on, you know, immediately, oh my gosh, I got to do a speech, and oh my gosh, and all of a sudden, um, you know, I, 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 and I said it clearly in the, in the speech that it, it not only was, oh my gosh, this all happened, oh my gosh, I forgot about all this, oh my, you know, your reflection of life, and then I'm sitting there realizing that I'm 50 something years old and oh my gosh, where did my life go? And oh my gosh, I was a bowler, you know, um, that it just seems so many years ago. And it, at the same time, it was one of the saddest times in my life, but it was one of the happiest because memories are, are what you have in life that you can always count on. Um, and you hope your memories never 
dull. You hope they never go away. Um, but yet I was reliving them like they were yesterday. And it was a really fun and sad time at the same time because of my, my, I, I, I got to do this speech. I got three months to do this speech. And, and, and I, and, 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 you know, one of the other things is I've been blessed. And I say this as I hope every single female bowler, uh, male, female youth, um, I'm blessed. Um, I, I don't believe there will be another Hall of Fame for me. Um, I, I'm fortunate that I believe that I, I have, I am now in probably all the Hall of Fames I'm going to get into. And, and I say that honored um, and that I really wanted to make sure that this speech was perfect because it was really the last time that I felt I was going to have the opportunity to really thank those people behind me that have contributed to my success in my life. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I loved your speech. And if you guys are interested in checking it out, it's available in the Bull TV archives. Um, I thought you did a fantastic job. It was, it was mm -hmm. tremendous. Hardest part of all of this, and even now, trying to look into the monitor is my trifocals, you know? Um, uh, uh, seeing my speech, being able to read it, trying to figure out what line to look through. But yes, uh, I, I, um, I hope every single female, every single male, I hope everybody always has the op opportunity um, and chance of a lifetime to be part of that. It was a, a real thrill to relive my career. It was. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I lost uh, I lost a little feed there. And and Wendy, that PWBA. Let me, uh, talk, sure about what Let me sorry, talk about Wendy. tour and Chad. You know, Chad started it out that he was our tour rep. Um, you know, really nicely though, a phenomenal tour rep. Um, you know, he was always there. The the only thing he ever failed me on was well, you know, again, old school. Just prior to any bit of uh, uh you know. Grips that are interchangeable was the fact oh, that we. Oh, Mike, Mike, are we out of time? And, you know, my, uh, uh, and the fact that I had a tendency to hack up sleeves, because we had to work mm -hmm. out all our own equipment, but it wasn't interchangeable um, from, from grips. It was, it was the fact that I had to work every bowling ball out, drill the ball or two a day, every day for 18 years type of thing. Anyways, I had a really bad habit of gluing, and, gluing. and it wasn't just a, a gluing. It wasn't just a dob, dob, dob. It was a full half circle, a bottle, half a bottle, it came out the bottom, <laughs> all of that. So now I need to get this sleeve out, and I need to get a new one plugged in. Chad, can you help me? Yeah, 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 I'll help you, absolutely. Toom, 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 slipped. The chisel slipped, went over there, a little scratch, blood came out. I quit, Wendy, and he walked out the door. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Carol Ann Giannotti. She's I still got a... Away. Can you guys see that? There's a scar there. There's an absolute I scar there. Uh, I'll, help I'll help you. And she got that until it all came out. Anyway, good time. Um, you know, but, he, but one thing, too, that I don't think was stressed enough. Chad was, it was an honor to have Chad. It was an honor to have a ball rep. You know, ball reps were few and far in between. It was it was not um, multiple ball reps. It was one that we might see once in two, in a, twice in an eight-week session because that's all that the company paid for was, Chad, you need to go here or, you know, so-and-so, you need to go there. And we were honored. The girls were honored. You know, I think nowadays there's a lot of girls that take it for granted. Um, we were honored and blessed to have a second set of eyes in those few weeks that we did throughout the year, it was not a common thing to have help. Yeah, it's certainly a different time, but uh, it was my pleasure, uh, Gwen, and, and it was a lot of fun to, to work with you and the ladies. And, and it did, 
absolutely give me a, a different perspective. And one of the things that I think is unique and, and I'm going to segue here, you know, into some of the other things is, you know, the unique perspective of greatness, right? When you think about all these great, you know, male bowlers on the PBA tour, and then you move over to the women's tour, you know, 27 times, you know, Leanne won, you know, Carolyn 20, you had 20, you go win 10 in Japan. You think about all that, there's, there's equal greatness on that tour. Um, and, you know, even Chris Berman at ESPN was when Sports Center was first starting up was quoting because PWBA led into Sports Center, and and that was wow. something that that they really uh, believed. Uh, the bowling audience leading into Sports Center was something that that really helped Sports Center, you know, early on. And so, you guys were uh, every bit as as important and still are today, uh, especially when it comes to you know seven year old girls and and looking up from an aspirational value. So, I, I just think it's amazing. I want to move though. You've, you've, you know, you, you hit on it there a little bit and you started talking about, you know, all the things that you've done since you've been bowling. Give us a quick overview, you know, you know, as, as much as you can, high roller, Brad Edelman, uh, tournaments. Uh, I know you coach, uh, a lot, uh, just, just what's been going on since, um, and you know, how important it is to you. Well, you know, I, I and again, having having met um, Chad, I started working in 1992 for Brad Edelman. I bowled the one and only, um, they allowed P a PBA members to bowl the Super Bowl high roller in 91. Ken Wagner won the tournament, and um, I bowled it. Um, lost my first match. I put up 1,000. I lost my first match. But went right to the owner, Brad Edelman, and said, please hire me. I would love to work for you guys. I'm out bowling, but if I'm home, can I come work the tournament? You know, I want to work the winner's circle. I want to turn the – that was the best part of it, to turn the wheel with all of the lanes, what time you drew, so on and so forth. So since 92, I've been working for Brad Edelman and the high roller, Chet Hunter, everybody that works for the high roller. I've been working tournaments. While I was home, based in Las Vegas, from tour. So at that time, um, you know, and then we fast forward all these words where I met Chad and his brother Billy and John Gaines and, you know, a n number of bowlers who are still my friends. Um, but now we fast forward to Japan, who just recently kicked, you know, kicked me out in 2012. <laughs> Evoked my membership, so now I am where am I going? And all right, I'm gonna go venture the strip. I'm gonna go venture a couple jobs in a casino. Let's check this all out. See what this is all about. Hey, boss, um, Brad. This is Brad. Hey, Brad. Sorry, I can't be working any more tournaments with you. At that time, it was a January military tournament. I can't be working any of the senior events. Um, and he says, How about this? You work for me full time. Oh my gosh. Yeah, let's do it. So it's been since, um, it was since 13 that I've, uh, 13, yeah, midway through 13 that I've been working for Brad full time. Um, I, I'm honored. Um, I absolutely adore my job. I'm, I, 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 I love it. And, um, you know, my job is to promote, talk to, hey, you want to bowl your military? Do you know about our tournament? You know, go to our website, check it out. Um, anyways, our numbers have significantly grown. Um, you know, I think we make a phenomenal team. And um, I, I love, love my job, which is what I'm doing still. Although I've been at home for a month and a half. Um, but that is my job that I'm hoping to go back to here in the next few weeks. Yeah, and hey, Wendy is part of that. And I want to talk about the military tournament because it's important to bowling. It's important to the, 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 the folks that are in the military, you know. You know, Brad has been, you know, one of those guys that has just been a, a part of bowling's fabric for so long. And when you think about, you know, his father, Norm, and, you know, they were pioneers in the space and, you know, made it possible for a lot of us to bowl all these tournaments. And, you know, I know you served on the USBC board at a time, uh, too, in, in terms of servicing bowling. But one of the things that I think is unique about this is, is you're this, you know, this icon, mm -hmm. this great bowler who you know, held these trophies and, and cashed the checks and was celebrated as the bowler. 
And now you transition to where you're, you know, you're the one that's responsible for others holding trophies, right? And being able to hold them up high. What just some perspective of what that, you know, feels like and, and the importance of it. And, you know, I, the difference in the two, I, they, they got to be completely different, but, but, but similar in some ways. But you hit it perfectly. They are totally different. Uh, am I jealous they're out there bowling and winning? Absolutely. Loved the win. Loved my heart to beat that great way it would used to beat. Um, but in the same token, <clears throat> I couldn't be happier for every single winner. I couldn't be happier. I, 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 I want every bowler who bowls our tournaments to win our tournaments. Um, you know, I don't want a bowler to not win. Um, and um, I've been blessed because I've now, I've been in the process of doing the complete opposite of what I grew up as, yet still in bowling. I can still walk out and watch people bowl. I can still watch ball reaction. I can still appreciate luck. I can appreciate greatness. <laughs> I can appreciate everything. And uh, while the tournaments are going on, I can clap. Um, you know, and, and, and really support all the bowlers. Um, but the, one of the great things though, and I love it is probably half of them don't even know I'm a bowler. And I like that because I'm Wendy and I, you know, I, I've given many lessons over the phones. I talk ball reaction all the time to customers, but I like Wendy because I really want to treat them exactly how I want to be treated and how I was treated. So I want to make sure that that's passed on, respecting them as much as I was respected when I bowled them. Well, and just, when I bowled them. just sharing that perspective, I'm going to bring the guys back in. Uh, you know, as somebody that at one time, a long time ago, walked up to a sweeper table to flip a coin to see what lane I was on, and you were sitting behind the counter walking up uh, to Wendy McPherson – you know, the, 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 one of the greatest women bowlers of all time, uh, you know, it, it's just so surreal. So I, I think it's probably both uh, that they, they know you and they don't, but do me a favor, just give everybody kind of an overview. I think the military tournament is one of those hidden gems in the industry. I, I think that the folks that bowl it know about it and they love it. And, you know, you know, Brad was so integral in, in making it bigger and better, but, but, but help help somebody who's listening to this that doesn't really know anything about the military term, and then we'll bring John Mark and Mike back in for a few questions. But just kind of give them an overview of of you know what it looked like and how it's grown and, and how much it means to to bowling really. It does. It's 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 our military, it's our active duty, it's our retired 20 year serve, um, it's our senior retireds, it's our 70 year olds, it's our 80 year olds. Um, you know, we, High Roller began in 2005 running the Military Bowling Championship. Um, and since that point in 2008, um, we started running the August Military Team Classic, complete opposites of each other. January is scratch, August is handicap. Um, January is 100% military, August is up to more than 50% requirements. If you're allowed to bring a family, friends, a non-military bowler is allowed to bowl our tournament. Point being is that we, um, we, you know, started with 32 tournaments, 32 teams the first year. This year, prior to the pandemic, um, we were at 1,200 sold out teams. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and last year we were 1,000, so that's a 200, 200 team game. 800 person game this year. Um, it's camaraderie, it's friendship, it's love, it's um, us loving the bowlers as much as they love us. It's just one big family. And, um, you know, we we have worked hard and um, it's, it is a hidden gem. If I was eligible, I would be bowling the tournament. Um, I am ineligible to bowl it. Um, but, um, you know, it's it's, we're at high-roller.com, um, our, our website, high roller, high-roller.com. So you can visit our tournaments. Um, one thing, too, Brad, um, Chad, is that by, you know, we're, we're, so we're two, two, two military tournaments a year, one senior event a year um, uh, through the high roller. 
Um, we've had a number of um, reservations brought up in October for our Columbus Day Seniors event, which is the 10th through the 16th, because bowlers are bowling the Open Championships up in Reno. So they are going to come swing through Vegas, go up to Reno, or they are going to go to Reno, come down and bowl our tournament. So they're making it. Very cool. Tournaments in Rome. Yeah. Very cool. Give, uh, give the folks a, a, a website where they can learn more about the military tournament. At our website, high-roller.com. Um, yeah. Don't read the dash um, between the two, but um, you can download our brochures there. We're in the process of getting January. Again, January is 100% scratch. August is, uh, is a handicap um, uh, tournament, so they're complete opposite tournaments. There is an 800 number. Call me. I'll answer the phone. We'll discuss it. Got it. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna roll uh, into the next hour for a few more minutes because I got a couple topics that that I want to you know do that we're gonna do as kind of a regular thing on this show. But Mike and John, Mark, JT, you have uh, have anything for Wendy before I get to that next subject? I could probably ask Wendy a million questions, but I just remember I just want to say uh, when Wendy was always that friendly face that you'd get that you'd see at the high roller before you'd get sent off to the slaughter. Uh, so. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's like when you when you die and you go to heaven and you see that friendly face before you walk in the pearly gates. Um, that's what Wendy was at the high roller for me. She was always smiling too. <laughs> I felt like I was going to win those matches after I saw Wendy. Yeah. Ah, uh, JC, and you know you didn't bowl well last squad, but go get him. You're going to win at this squad. That's I mean, right. That's right. right. That's right. right. <laughs> hey, Wendy, you mentioned earlier the importance of having a memories that you have amassed over the course of your career, and in particular when we gave that most recent Hall of Fame speech. So I, I wanted to take you all the way back to Walnut Creek Bowl and the, your days bowling there as a kid with your sister Blair and ask you what memories stand out to you now as you look back on those early days in your uh, in your bowling experience. Uh, all my memories, that's where it all began. To where I I walked in and my sister was bowling league and I'm like I've got a ball mom I can't I can't go to a babysitter I got a ball Blair's bowling I, I need the ball um, going there every day after school running over there playing the pinball machine eating a Afogato's pizzeria that was there um, going across the street to the Lippers um, Walnut Bowl and, and it's interesting on Facebook I joined a joined a group. Walnut Creek back then and now, and a topic of Walnut Bowl came up, and um, you know it, it, it was 40 years ago. It, it closed relatively, um, you know, within a few years of me starting my career at age seven. But I also remember Wood Lanes. I also remember not being old enough to uh, um, Wood Approaches. Sorry, not being uh, old enough to wear shoes, big enough to wear shoes, bowling shoes. Wow. So I used to bowl my socks. I remember throwing a gutter ball, falling down and crying. My father reprimanded me. He said, absolutely, you never cry. But dad, I have a splinter. I had a splinter in my bottom, you mm. know, and uh, from the approach, and it's, a, and it's the truth. Um, point is, is great memories. It's where I bowled every Sunday with my dad. It's where... It's where bowling became Walnut Bowl, and bowling became my love. I fell in love with it at Walnut Bowl, definitely. Mike, you got one before I? Yeah, I just got one. I got a simple, simple question with a slight story with it, okay? So okay. the question I have for you, Wendy, is I just want to know, when is the last time you've laced them up and hit the lanes? I was due to lace them up and hit the lanes March 17th and leave, um, but that was canceled. So it was, I'm two months into it without having laced them up and hit the lanes. Laced them up and hit the lanes competitively a couple years ago with um, the, with a couple PWBA events I did. You ever get the itch to, to get out there and compete now? Oh, yeah. I get the itch. I get the itch to win. You know, uh, Chad was made mention of ESPN and PWBA highlighting it. Do you know what it was like to be on an uh, ESPN live show? I mean, live, ESPN, 
um, you know, that's how our career started with ESPN and live shows and to have your heart just beat that way. And do I get the itch? I want that heart to beat that way, but I don't get the itch after I see my score because I haven't put enough effort and time and practice into it. So it's a double-edged sword. Okay. And, and who, who had your number? Who was, who was the toughest for you to beat? Nobody. No, I lost their share to, to uh, I, I'm going to do 50%. Um, I could tell you I lost 278 to 279 to Leanne, but I beat her at the Queens one year. Um, you know, if Carolyn had beat me a number of times. I beat Carolyn. Um, you know, uh, I, there was really nobody had my number in that they won more than I, than I did. I want to say I was pretty much 50-50 with a lot of these bowlers. Okay, fifty fifty with the greatest of all time. That's pretty good. That speaks to yeah, and that and let's segue into that because you know one of the things that we've been talking about is you know that we 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 might not haggle enough over some of the you know great topic of sport, and so we're gonna ask folks on the show regularly kind of a fun topic, which is you know who's the who's the greatest bowler of all time, uh, male and female. Who who is it? And Wendy, you're obviously you know. Bowler of the decade, all the things. I know you have a ton of respect for everybody around you, and you just did it again with Leanne and Carolyn. So I hope people can pick up on that because you have such an appreciation for it. But you're one of those people that you're you're an expert uh, when it comes to bowling, uh, all things bowling. And I just heard a quote that's going to stay with me. I had to bowl. I got to bowl. I got to bowl. And you did it as a child on John Mark's question. Then you came back and talked about it in league on March 17th. So that's a pretty amazing ride when you think about it. And so that'll be one of my takeaways from this. But I want to open it up to the group uh, and I want to have a, a quick dialogue. When somebody asks me who's the greatest bowler of all time, I always give two names. Always give two names. The first is Lonnie Wallachek and the second is <laughs> Del Ballard Jr. Right. Those are the greatest bowlers of all time, in my opinion, for the reasons that I get. And we always say, hey, everybody gets to have their opinion. Uh, and on the women's side, it, it's it's Winnie McPherson for me. Uh, even though there's all of these great players, and, and obviously those are, are friendships that develop that. But let's try and, and real quick have a, a somewhat uh, competent conversation. We'll start with an expert. Wendy, who's the who's the, the greatest uh, male bowler that, that you've seen in your lifetime? Um, I'm going to have to go with uh, a lefty, lefty righty of 20 years ago. I'm going to go with Mark Ross. Uh, Earl, um, uh, new new ways. I'm going to go with Jason Belmonte. Um, uh, again, his career is not done. So, um, but will he be? Absolutely, he's phenomenal. Anybody else want to weigh in first? She did a pretty good job of not saying one and, and splitting the new wave. So, well done there, Gwen. Who who's up yeah. next? Yeah, I always have to hedge. You know, I, for me, the guys is a three-horse race. It's uh, Walter Ray, Earl, and Belmo. Um, you know, I just think Belmo has the best trick that's ever anybody's ever had. You know, Roth had a great trick, but it only lasted so long until everybody figured it out. And had a, he had a few competitors. Belmo, nobody's really figured out his thing, and I think it's just because he's a great bowler. He can... You know, you saw the, the couple of matches he's had with Simonson recently, one where he played way left to Simonson. And then so you'd think, OK, well, he's always going to be left to Simonson. Then on the next major finals, he's playing, you know, two arrows right to Simonson and he beats him. So, I, I, you know, he's he's definitely right there. And if he just if he wins a few more majors, I don't think there's going to be any question. Um, Earl was just great. Um, there was no trick. It was just greatness. Um, there was just nothing he did, you know, they tried to shut him out and he would still win. So, I mean, he's great. Uh, but I would, I would have to lean to Walter being the greatest of all time. And it's mostly just because of some of the things that I've seen him do personally. Um, I saw him play outside at the U S open when the year he finished second to Del Ballard, he led by 600 pins. Uh, he played second arrow in match play and everybody else was playing between fifth and sixth arrow. And, you know, players like Ozio were, were trying to play out there and they couldn't break 150. And, you know, I've also seen him shoot 800 for three games with uh, with an odor eaters ball on a strip lane. So in, in my mind, he's the greatest um, on the men's side, but Belmo can still get him. Mm -hmm. Mike. 
Well, I wish I had a little more time for research as we welcome uh, Jean-Marc back here. So I'm going to go off the rails like I typically do, and like, I, like I've been known to do. Um, one kick I've been on this week on our Inside Bowling show is I've been talking about Dick Weber's career. You know, the, the PBA wasn't founded until 1959, and he was 31 years old when he took to the tour. He won three of the first four events. I believe he won seven of ten events one year, and he went on to win uh, 30 uh, 30 titles on, on the PBA tour uh, from age 31 on, which is pretty impressive. And a lot of people don't mention him in the, in that regard. We had EJ Tackett on the show this week. He has 13 titles at age 27. Uh, if he wins five more between now and, and the point that he's 31, he would be at 18. Add 30 to that, Dick Weber's career, he'd be at 48 titles. So think about if Dick Weber would have had a tour earlier and what he would have done or how he could have dominated so I'm just going to say and go off the rails here and, and give a little tribute here to Dick Weber with the passing of Juanita a couple of weeks ago. And go Dick Weber on the men's side, who I don't think it's much of a mention. On the on the women's side, I'm going to go off the rails again, uh, and I'm going to go based off of whether or not the tour would have kept going or not. If the tour would have kept going, I feel like one of the hottest bowlers on the tour, and because of the rev rate that she had, and she bowled 300 on national television with Michelle Feldman, if Michelle Feldman would have been able to continue to compete for many years into the future, we might be talking about her as the greatest bowler of all time. And I'm interested to see how Jordan Richard performs because she's the modern day Michelle Feldman and how her career will progress being at such an early age and with the PWBA back in action and hopefully for a very long time. Uh, I'm anxious to see how she can uh, springboard her career and if the power player will start to become a dominant force on the PWBA tour, because so far in the five years since it's been reintroduced, it's been straighter is greater with Liz Johnson as player of the year for three years. And then uh, Shannon O'Keefe for two years. So I'm interested to see how the player power player comes into a play for player of the year on the PWBA tour. And I'm just upset that we don't have the tour right now to be able to find out and, and see how that was going to roll out this year, but looking forward to hopefully getting the tour going this year. Uh, so those are my two. I'm going to go Dick Weber. Michelle Feldman going completely off the radar here. John Mark. Uh, I, I loved what Jason had to say about uh, Walter Ray. It's certainly a compelling case for me. Um, and I know that this is a distinction that Walter Ray himself makes when he's asked about who the greatest on the PBA side is. The difference is just that Walter Ray was player of the year in 1986 and player of the year in 2010, the longevity of his career. Um, is at once one of the more remarkable things about his achievement, but also to me uh, underscores the difference between Walter Ray's career and Earl Anthony's career. And, and Mike just mentioned the truncated period of time within which Dick Weber did his damage on the PBA tour starting uh, at, at age 30. And, and Earl, of course, started a little older. The vast majority of his accomplishment on the PBA tour was confined to the 1970s. Uh, and as Walter Ray himself says, this is a very short period of time in which Earl amassed 41 titles. I uh, came away from Barry Sparks' recent biography of Earl Anthony more convinced than ever that Earl was the greatest of all time. Um, I love this one uh, anecdote in, in the book uh, in which uh, Earl Anthony is uh, sitting down having lunch with Larry Lichtstein. And uh, they're, they're talking to, uh, and, and Earl tells Larry that, uh, the difference between himself and Larry is that uh, Earl has 41 hand positions and Larry had two. And that's why Earl was out there bowling and Larry was drilling his stuff. Uh, you know, and in addition to all the different hand positions, Earl was a master of speed control, too. So master of speed control, a, a, a incredibly versatile range of hand positions and all the combinations between those hand positions and the different speeds at which uh, Earl had achieved mastery. To me, it's mind-boggling, uh, the incredible uh, talent that he has. And on the women's side, for me, I, I, I think it's, a, it's a, a, a lock right now that it's Liz Johnson. The amount of U.S. Women's Opens she's won, the things that she's done since the PWBA Tour was relaunched are equally as mind-boggling to me. Like Mike, I very much look forward to seeing uh, what the future holds still for Shannon O'Keefe coming off an, a, an incredibly a sensational season uh, most recently. Uh, and her last couple of years have been uh, just beyond comprehension. I see that continuing just as, as Mike mentioned, though, I also see the likes of, of a Jordan Richards uh, and, and others come up and, um, and really start to stake a greater claim on tour. So, Man, can we start bowling again? I'm ready to start yeah. talking about some action. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Wendy, you, like, you want to go you on? Like, you like how I ducked the, the women's side of it? Yeah. With, uh, you know, with <laughs> Wendy sitting there and with my involvement <laughs> with PWBA. <laughs> Wendy, you want to take a, a run at the women's? 
Oh, did you lose your earpiece? I'm sorry. Uh, we we can't. Well, if you want, I can. I'll take a crack at the women's side. Go ahead, JT. Uh, all right. So so for me, it's it's a little bit uh, uh, closer race. More more players involved. Um, I think it's about five horse race. Um, and Wendy's Wendy's in that group. I mean, when Norm Duke. Uh, votes for player of the year each year his criteria is who would I trade seasons with and usually people would trade seasons with someone who made more money or the most money and nobody's made more money than Wendy <laughs> so I think I think you could you could make that argument for sure I picked Walter on the men's side he's made the most money um, but I do think it's hard it's hard because there wasn't a tour for 12 years and so um I would give the edge to Liz Johnson just because of the number of majors. And I really think during that time when the tour was off, she would have exploded. She, oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, who knows how she might have 50 or 60 Absolutely. titles. I mean, um, you know, I think Wendy would have, would have had a bunch more titles. Yep. Carolyn would have had a bunch more titles. She's in the conversation as well. Uh, uh, Leanne is in the conversation. I think you have to put Lisa Wagner in the conversation too, because she still is the all time title holder. But um, I'm going to I'm going to I would have to go with Liz Johnson. Yeah. Uh, good conversation. Uh, I, I'm going to liken it when I, I want to you know, we can't hear you. So I'm just going to tell you how much I love you. And thanks for being here. Uh, right. And then I'll answer the question after you leave and you'll have to get it later on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thanks for being here. Uh, you've been a wonderful guest for us and we'll certainly have you back on in the future. But keep doing what you do. Keep coaching those those folks out there and, and taking care of the, those tournaments and, and tell Brad, uh, I said hi when you get a chance. So thanks for being here, Gwen. Uh, you know, just to continue that on for just a minute. And again, I, I'm, I almost sent a note to John Mark this morning that said, uh, Hey, just an FYI, I'm going to give you a quote on this show. That's going to do nothing but get me in trouble uh, <laughs> and get me, you know, screamed at. And what's the executive director of USBC doing talking on a show about, of uh, this topic. And so I, I'm not going to do that though, because I, I think it would have been funny uh, and it might be funny later on, but here's how I would express it. And, and the reason why I really wanted to hear Winnie answer that question is because I think the players themselves know, right. And I just tell a, a quick funny story and I'll do it with male and female. Uh, wonderful player, Richie Wolf and Ricky Ward uh, lefties that were bowling on the tour when I was out there. And of course they were there before I, I got out there as a tour rep and, and after uh, there's no confusion with those two guys, how great a uh, Jason couch is. And if you talk to Jason couch, there's, there's no conversation or question in Jason couch's mind, how good Parker bone is. And if you talk to Parker bone, there's no question or conversation about how great Mike Albee was. And if you talk to all of those folks, there's no, you know, real argument or conversation about how great Earl Anthony was. And again, I'm segmenting down to the left side of the lane. But when you really think about that, right, it, it's just it's just so clear when it when it comes to that, you can argue inside each each realm. But Earl is obviously the, the, the best left handed player. Uh, and I think it was it was interesting that when the PBA did its you know top 100. But then when you move over to the right side of the lane, it gets complicated because we fail at times to give everybody credit. And Mike, I'm going to give you a lot of credit here because. I think you you absolutely have to be the best of your generation. And so there's only four or five guys that we're even talking about in the conversation uh, because you you have to have had dominant you know performances. And so I, I'm not going to dig into it too much when you get into that. And then when you get onto the women's side, it's the same thing. Somebody, a, a name that no one will, will really under, Tiffany Stambro, uh, when the tour went out, she had just really started. And would she had a, a career compared to Alita Sills at the end if the tour had had kept motoring? And you think about Wendy and Carolyn and Leanne, of course. And, you know, everybody's going to say, well, I don't even know why we have to pick one. And so I choose not to. I choose not to. Uh, other than to say this, what Belmo is doing right now uh, it is nothing like I've ever witnessed. Yep. Um, it, it's nothing like I've ever Big Mark Roth fan, uh, Marshall Holman, uh, certainly, you know, my, my good buddy, Del Ballard. And so I choose to answer the question that uh, Lonnie Wallachek is the greatest bowler I've ever seen. <laughs> and that uh, Jennifer Doherty Murphy uh, is the best female bowler. <laughs> That's a smart answer. Uh, so, 
Hmm. Um, and you know, a close second to uh, Lonnie Wallachek would would be uh, Brian Wallachek. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anything you guys want to offer as perspective before we get out of here? I, I got a, a couple, uh, you know, housekeeping things. But anything I can help with, or anything you'd like to talk about? I would just say that uh, you know what John Mark said earlier about getting back to bowling. It, it, that's that's what's so great about running these events is you get to find out who's the best, you know, and and. The thing that's cool about doing it for USBC is you get you get the best at every level, you know, the youth level, the collegiate level, the amateur level, and the professional level. And so being being able to do that and be a part of that is is a privilege. Being able to, to meet and talk to people like Wendy McPherson um, and cover them and and uh, you know have Hall of Fame events so that they can be heard and seen and remembered is 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 a privilege. And I'm just looking forward to getting back to it as soon as we can. Me too. Mike, you want to, anything yeah. you'd like to close with? I'll share two quick stories. Number one, Tiffany Stamborough, right? I used to get this uh, quarterly, I think, magazine when I was a YABA, Young, Amer Young American Bowling Alliance uh, member. They used to have the top stars. Do you guys remember this magazine that used to come out? Top 10 list, top scores. Yeah. Yep. And it had all the 300s and 800s listed. And back then, you know, there weren't as many as there are today. And I remember reading and glancing over this thing as I would go compete in, in youth tournaments throughout the country. And there was one standout female name that was like, she bowled three 800s this year. And it was like, there's no man that did that. Maybe Rory Kalonquin did it or, right. or, or a Dave Ewald, right? Those were the guys at the same time. And, and it was Tiffany Stamborough. So I mm -hmm. think you hit, you hit the nail on the head. What would her career would have looked like? And it brought me back to those magazines. I, I loved getting those magazines, especially when you're a kid, because you don't get mail typically when you were a kid. So when mom says, Hey, I got a piece of mail for you, Michael, <laughs> that was amazing. And then to have all that content in there. So I just remember that. Um, and then the second thing was just having Wendy on today. I I would I want to tell the story that that Harvey Johnson, he's a backer. A lot of people know Harvey oh, yeah. Johnson. He went up to Cameron Doyle, and I overheard this conversation. I'm throwing Cameron under the bus here, so I apologize, buddy. But he walked up to him and said, hey, Cameron, do you have a partner for the Lucy? And he said, no, I, I don't. He goes, well, I got a partner for you. How would you like to bowl with Wendy McPherson? Hmm. And, and, and Cameron Doyle said, who's Wendy McPherson? Oh. Okay. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there. He obviously knows who she is now because I had to walk over and talk to him about it. But I think anybody that's watching this program that has some extra time on their hands, which a lot of us do, and if you're a part of the younger generation and you're not familiar with the PWBA tour before the relaunch, I would challenge you to go out there and look up on Wikipedia, try to figure out what the tour looked like back in the day, and watch some of these videos that are, that are available on YouTube. I think you would learn a lot. You'd get a lot more appreciation for what the PWBA was in the past and, and how it is now. So that was, those are my two little thoughts here to close, and thanks for having me on the program. John Mark? Uh, Chad, you mentioned earlier that though this is May 1 is sort of opening day for Texas, uh, uh, USBC staff is still working at, from home. I'm curious, you know, how are you thinking about the decision to to have people working out of the office again? What circumstances need to take place for you to feel comfortable with that? That's a great question. And, and we're taking a, a, a real slow approach to that. We have uh, exhibited the ability to, to service the membership uh, from our homes in a very safe environment. And uh, I've been reading a lot about, you know, businesses and what they're doing to reopen, you know, the office and will the, the office ever be the same and those types of things. So thanks mm -hmm. for the question. Um, you know, the health and safety of our employees and our members and, and people everywhere is all that, that really matters at this point. And so we're going to take a much slower approach to it. Um, we, we did put a group together here um, you know, to look at some things like social distancing within our office, you know, we have some cube environments that aren't six feet apart. And so we're going to make, take some time to make some adjustments to that. We have some open air, you know, places at the campus that, you know, can be a little bit more closed off. And, and so we'll, we'll take a look at that. But, um, you know, the other piece of it is, you know, some folks are going to be more comfortable coming back to work than others. And so, we went through an exercise last week with a good portion of our staff and having some of those conversations and we just asked them. And so we're going to take a much slower approach. I read an article, you know, talking about, you know, legal liability for CEOs, mm. um, you know, and that they have to consider and bringing folks back. 
Yeah. Um, and so if there's concern, you know, I, I just don't see, you know, putting folks in harm's way. But we're going to know a lot in two weeks and in four weeks. And we'll take another look at it after this two weeks, um, you know, and then we'll take another look at it two weeks down the road from that. At some point in time, there'll be a soft opening where, you know, kind of leadership comes back and then there'll be an optional period and then everybody will return to work at some point. But I would not want to go on record as to when that will be because we yeah. want to make sure everybody's health and, and safety. Mm -hmm. You have anything you want to close with, John Mark? I got a, I got a couple of three things that I, I think you guys are going to think are interesting. But at the same time, uh, I want to give you the opportunity. Sure. Well, uh, the only thing I would I would close with is is there are a lot of uh, uh, great episodes I think of the Bowlers Journal podcast coming up. People can find the podcast on SoundCloud. We had Jason Belmonte on yesterday. We have some of the biggest names in bowling coming on the podcast in the next week. Um, so I hope people will uh, check us out on SoundCloud, the Bowlers Journal podcast up there, and stay tuned as uh, further episodes come out in the days ahead. Thank you. I want to hit the media again. Uh, I want to talk about all this great coverage and uh, I want to you know, be specific about all of this great coverage. Um, and Mike, I'm going to I'm going to do it with, you know, kind of segueing the story that, that you just talked about and who knew who from before um, and, and tell a similar story. I was at the it was either Masters or the U.S. Open at Carolier a few years ago. And, um, uh, you know, a group was headed into the bar after they got done bowling friend of mine uh, has someone with him that I do not know, but we walk into the bar uh, and we sit down and this gentleman who's a very young player uh, sits down next to me on the right. And then my, my friend across the table and he says, Hey, I, I got to go to the restroom. And I said, yeah, no problem. And he takes off. And so I start talking to this, this person that I just met for the first time. And obviously we're, we're leaving the names out uh, to protect the innocent. Um, <laughs> And Del Ballard walks in, uh, not in like any other time where, you know, we've been in a space like that. And he said, hi. And he said, hey, I got to go over here for a minute. Do you mind if I sit with you? And I said, no, of course. Uh, here, I'll just throw your stuff on this chair and, and, um, and hang out. And then he walks away. And the kid that's sitting next to me, and again, it, it probably was a little bit intimidating for him, too, uh, when you think about all these folks walking around. But he leans over and, and he says, hey, do you know that guy? And he points over and I see Dell talking to Chris Schlemmer, uh, who's uh, the Rotogrip, uh, uh, you know, brand manager uh, across the, the bar now. And, and I said, yeah, that's Chris Schlemmer. He, you know, used to used to be a ball rep out here. And now he's, you know, he's moved up and, and he's, you know, a, a, a big wig, if you will, at, at, at Storm and Rotogrip. And he goes, no, no, no. The, the guy that's standing next to him that you were just talking to. Do you know him? And I, I, I didn't know what to do, Mike. Uh, and John Mark, I can see you smiling. And JT, yeah. I'm sure this happened to you too. But I like did a double take, and I said, "Well, that's that's Del Ballard." And and he goes, "Yeah, he you know he's the guy that that hands out balls for Storm." And I was so flustered. I, I was so upset. And all I said was, "Oh, oh yeah, yeah, Del's a, a good friend of mine. I've known him for a long time." All right. And then my buddy who had left to go to the bathroom comes back and he sits down and he can just tell something's off. Right. And, and I'm still talking to this, this young man, but, but it's odd. And, <laughs> and, and Del, you know, and then Dell comes back over and, and my buddy who, you know, has been a close personal friend of mine for a lot of years and still is today. He's, he's part of a group uh, text that, that we've been moving around. And again, I, I know I'm belaboring the point, but there is a point here. Right. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, do me a favor. And, and he said, what? And I said, just don't ever leave me at a table uh, with someone who's a bowler who doesn't know who Del Valle is. <laughs> <laughs> just don't ever do that to me again. And he goes, what do you mean? And then he started a conversation with this person and they had this great conversation. But it, it was a great learning for me along what you're talking about, Mike, that we've got a long way to go. And with everybody doing these shows and talking about bowling and John Mark, you've been doing it for a long time and Bowlers Journal has been doing it for a long time. We have to do more of it. We have to support those that are doing it and bringing somebody like Wendy on this show is just a, another example because she has, you know, moved on from this wonderful bowler and this wonderful career to where she's actually servicing bowling now and she's crowning champions herself and what she does. And I'm really proud of her for that. Uh, 
And, I, and I'm not sure sometimes whether I want her to be more recognized for that now than I want her to be recognized as the bowler that she was. And in the end, it's both. You think about what Leanne Holzenberg's doing with the Storm Youth Championships from her 27 titles to now handing out, you know, trophies and those types of things. It's just really incredible. But but we do have to preserve and hold on to our tradition and history. And so I hope uh, for those that watch the show, they, they kind of understand some of that. We'll be uh, featuring uh, some business next week with with Frank DeSocio being on the show. Uh, and it'll be, you know, really a lot about uh, what's going on in centers. And, and John Mark, I know you'll have some questions from Frank and Mike, you will too. And then we'll move towards, you know, Frank, uh, the social, the person. And he's he's another guy front row for Mike Albee shooting 300 against David Ozio's 279. So we'll get into some of that too, uh, cool. which I think will be fun. Uh, so I, I, I want to thank John Mark, you for being here in Bowler's Journal and Mike uh, for you being here for Inside Bowling and JT. I, I know you've got a lot of hard work to do being the hardest working man in bowling uh, for the rest of the day. So I'll let you get back to that. But I just want to close by saying I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, look for more of this from us. Look for association leaders that will come in. There's some great Facebook activity on the association side that took place this week. I got a wonderful note about an association leader that went on to Facebook and was talking about the, the benefits of, of USBC local association work as part of that. So that will be a piece of the show too, and it will just continue to evolve. But then lastly, I want to thank my good friend, Winnie McPherson for, for coming on the show and, and, and thank her for what she's doing. And, and, uh, and, and just amazed uh, when you think about how she's transitioned from uh, being someone, uh, uh, an icon within the sport to servicing it. And so I'll just close by again, thanking everybody that's that's going the extra mile for us, all the grocery workers, the medical, uh, the nurses, uh, all the folks that have been uh, distressed in this time and, and know we're thinking about you. And we will uh, see you next week. So thanks, everybody.